praise one everybody. We have like 30 seconds, but it just stand with me. Good to see everybody here. We are doing all that we can to slice down these amazing um, cinnamon rolls. Um, good to see everybody, and welcome to our <coughs> our Sunday school class. Before we get started, um, <coughs> I think that God really wants to do something powerful in this place. How many believe that? Amen. How many need God to do something powerful in our lives? Amen. Let's welcome the Lord. Lord, we love you today. We're honoring your name. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So God, I pray, help us to work out our salvation today. Help us not to just let this day pass away without us magnifying your name. God, that we would impart faith in this day in the things that we deal with. We need you as we launch into our week, oh God. But we're asking God that while we're here, those that are watching by way of online and, and those that are in this room, that God, your will would be accomplished in us. Minister to every woman, man, every child, every every teenager, every college and career age. Lord, that your name would be exalted. And Lord, we give you the praise and the honor for who you are and what you're doing. In the name of Jesus. And they all said? Amen. And they all said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated today. Brother Zimmerman, if you'll come up. Um, I wanted to say that um, with, with our guests that we've been having, um, that I've just been drawn. Um, I've been drawn to having these ministry talks because God did not save us that we would just look good in a facility. That God didn't just save us so that we could get some goosebumps and that we could get, just kind of walk through life. And, but he called us to be progressive and productive. That we right. would progress in our walk with God and that would be productive in our faith. Mm -hmm. And so every, every person that we've brought... Um, I was thinking about this earlier this morning in my new office. Have you, have you checked out my new office? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Our classroom that they've redone, it's just, it's so peaceful in there. And so I was thinking that, you know, every ministry that, that we have, that there's not one ministry that just covers everything else and we're all just these cookie cutters. Every one of us, did I say everyone? Every one of us, has a uniqueness to our ministry. And so what my desire has been in these, in these ministry talks is that um, there's not one minister that's the total package. There's not one ministry team that's the total package. But everybody comes with a unique perspective. And uh, my goal has been that we could sit and teach and lecture and, and talk about those things. But sometimes it's just Jesus talked to most of the people that he talked to in some kind of a story format. He, he communicated. And so with that being said, of course, we're very glad to have Brother Zimmerman and his whole family, his entourage, security detail with him. Um, very honored to have them. They were here um, for a while that we were so blessed to have their ministry and their love for people and that kind of stuff. And so we're going to open up. If you will give me, are you on? I'm on. Good. Um, give us just a little snapshot of, you know, kind of where your ministry started um, that has kind of brought you kind of to land where you're at in Kenosha. Um, so I, I grew up as a bus kid riding a Sunday school bus and... Um, went to a Christian school halfway through school, um, felt a desire to go to Bible college, went, got a four-year degree in, in theology, graduated, got married, and went to another uh, city in Ohio as uh, a youth pastor. There I was a youth pastor for a couple years and then uh, moved on to become associate pastor the remainder of the time there. And then the Lord began to deal with us. I, I, we were very comfortable where we were. We, we loved our home. We loved our jobs. And God said, it's time to move. 
And so he started through confirmation, through people praying for us and, and sharing things, um, we started to see that it was time to, to go to another location. And so the Lord opened an opportunity for us to plant a church in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and we've been there now four years. Wow. Four years. At what point in this whole thing did you finally say yes to Sister Jen's um, proposal to, to be married? So when did you guys get married? How long have you been married? Uh, I've been married 27 years. See what happens when you say yes? (laughs) I just had to figure it out. (laughs) She had it all figured out. I had to. So so what kind of ministry was Sister Jennifer involved in? Um, in, At Parkway? Yeah. Um, Just kind of behind the scenes. She did office work and um, helped in different behind the scenes ministries. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of things that she did there. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until we went uh, to Circleville that the Lord just kind of expanded that, you know, to where the Lord moved her out of her comfort zone. Where did you go to Bible college? Stockton, California. Is it true that you were student body president? Yes. True. All right, cool. Um, so what is one thing that you love about your life ministry right now? Um, I love being a pastor. I, I love helping people. I, I, love, I love sharing the word of God and watching the light come on of revelation because revelation does not come outside of hunger and desire in seeking more of God. If you're satisfied with where you are and you're content, then you will not grow. And just to watch the light come on in people's lives, I, I absolutely love it. What is a, there, there's a, a place that we're gonna land for a while. So I I wanna ask him a couple questions before we get to that place. Um, So in ministry, in life, there's always challenges. Mm -hmm. So what is a couple challenges, not so much the challenges in and of itself, but what are some lessons that you learned through some of the challenges that you have been forced to go through? Um, One of the biggest, I would say, is submission. Um, Submitting, submission doesn't happen until you disagree. If somebody asks you to do something, that's just agreement. That's just working together. But when you you do not agree and God has placed that leadership over you, that's when submission takes place. And that, that was very hard for me because in between the youth pastor position and the associate pastor position, there was a few years where I did nothing. Um, and I watched everything that I wanted to do in youth ministry given to the next guy. But when I was there, it was no. And it was very hard for me to watch. But I was submitting to the leadership in my life. Even if the leadership is not doing the right things, if, if my heart was not right, I would be in trouble with God. And so I had to get my heart right. And as long as I take care of me, Folks, as long as you take care of you and you're in the right place with Jesus, everything's going to be all right. And so I had to, I had to submit to that. And, and it was difficult because I was thinking, why am I here? Thoughts went through my mind. I have a four-year degree. I have a bachelor's in theology, and I'm sitting on the front row doing nothing. And my parents want to see their grandkids. What am I doing here? And so I just waited until... You know, God said to go or God said to move. And, and you know, the next pastor that came in, um, he, he, he asked me this. He said, Z, what, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. I said, I haven't been released. He said, and I, I didn't see this within myself. He said, you're, you're like a diamond in the rough. What, what do you, you want to do? So I pursued getting my license. I pursued uh, other ministries, things in what I became at that church is they, they said, add Jeff and stir. If you need a Sunday school teacher, if you need a worship leader, if you need a lesson, you, if you need something developed, you, you need a material made, you, you, whatever it is, if you, if, if you need a drummer, if you need whatever. And so I just learned over the years, as long as I keep my heart right, as long as I focus on what God has for me. Because when God called Moses, he said, Moses, what's in your hand? He didn't ask him because he didn't know what was in Moses' hand. Moses had to realize what was in his hand. 
And so when he looked, he said, it's a staff, and he threw it down. When you submit yourself to God and you do what God wants you to do, what you have in your hand is natural, but when God uses it, it becomes supernatural. So I think the biggest thing was submission. Um, we've talked about, about this a lot. Num number one is one of the things that I appreciate about Brother Zimmerman and, um, and knowing that he is not just the front man for the whole family, but him and Sister Zimmerman are an incredible team sure. together that God has divinely put them together. And so although I'm asking you questions, I know that a lot of this is coming through your guys' involvement. And I've always appreciated your love for people. Yeah. Um, when, I, when we were talking and it opened up, I felt like it was a blessing. And uh, sometimes blessings are not totally clean. Sometimes there's a mess in, in that process. When you came here, how long did, were you here? Eight, eight months. Eight months. Um, so for me and my wife, this is the first time that we've been able to do ministry in 26 years with um, friends, childhood friends that we, were, that we were raised around because when we got in ministry, we, we left home. And so that was, that was so good and therapeutic for our church. Um, we had so many people that were praying through the Holy Ghost. Um, they are very gifted in walking through um, some of those things. Do you feel like there was anything that in those eight months that either that you learned or that God enhanced in your life? I found healing here. Um, when we were to move on in, the, in our ministry, like I said, we were very comfortable and God needed to, to break that comfort. He needed to remove us from that situation. And so it got very difficult for us. And so some of the things that were said and some of the things that were done, it, it wounded us. And we came here and found healing in the house of God. Because, folks, we, we just have to face it. We deal with people. And people sometimes say things or do things that hurt you. And it's not the church. It's, it's not God's people. It's, it's, this is where you can find healing. Although I was broken in the house of God, I found healing in the house of God. If, if the Bible talked about there was, there was famine in the land and there was no bread in, in Bethlehem, Judah, and, and that's the name of the place is the house of bread. Our answer for our brokenness is not outside of the church. Our answer is in the church. People can hurt you, yes. People say things that can, that can wound you. But also, the only place that you can find the healing that you need is here in the house of God. And so I would say thank you, Life Source, for your commitment to making sure that this is a safe place for no matter who comes in. Amen. So thank you for that. So you're, you, you won't stop talking. You came in last night, and we've been talking about this. Okay, let's talk about growth. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about where you are, the process, mm -hmm. um, when you went to pastor that 15,000 member church yeah. or, <laughs> or those things and money was never a problem right. and resource was never a problem. So talk to us, mm -hmm. talk to us through your experiences about growth where you are. So when we got to Kenosha, we, there was nothing there. There was no church. We started with zero. We started with our family. Um, and so we attended Parkway Apostolic Church. Um, we wanted to do a daughter work. So we became a daughter work at Parkway. And there was just, there was no one. So I was going to start with Bible studies in small groups. And so we started meeting for Bible studies in small groups. And God began to draw people. I had a guy show up at our Bible study. He said, oh, I thought you were your brother. I have a brother in Wisconsin. And I, well, I thought, well, he's not going to stay because I'm not John, so he's going to leave. No, he ended up staying, and he thought, huh, that's not too bad. <laughs> he tells his wife about it, and, and they were backslid for nine years. Whew. 
Todd began coming to Bible study, and God began to get a hold of his heart. His wife was not living for God at the time. And she started to see a change in him, and she said, what's going on with you? Because they were, they were both in the church. She sang on the platform at district conference. And they were, they were not living for God. So she decides to come check out Bible study. They're standing in my kitchen, tears running down their face. I said, I'm not interested in your singing. I'm interested in you being saved. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, I know that, Becca, you can sing well. But more importantly, I want you to be saved. And she said, Pastor, I don't think I'll ever be able to get back. I said, you're right. You're going to go farther. Never settle to try to get back to where you were. Yes. Go farther yes. with God. All things are possible. Yes. Today we are here in Wellston, Ohio, she is leading worship. They came back. They've been with us four years. All four years, they're doing phenomenal. They have their challenges. We all have our challenges. But she's leading the church in worship today. I, all I can say is, wherever you're at and whatever's going on in your life, don't, don't settle for just getting back. Push yourself. God... God can give you the ability to go beyond yourself. Tell, tell about what else she's done outside of church. So um, God started dealing with Becca's heart about fasting. And she, this was all on her own. And, and she, God started calling her into a fast, into a 40-day fast. And I've taught the church that fasting is more than just no food and, and just water. There's all kinds of fasts you can do. Media fast and, and uh, you know certain kinds of food and going without coffee. I mean, that could kill some people. I mean, that, that can go to cutting and, you know, drug overdose and just... But she went on this fast and God was just drawing her heart. And about two weeks into it, I said, Becca, don't ever go back to where you came from. I could just see Jesus all over her. And she began to tell me, Pastor, God's drawn me here and God's speaking to my heart about this. And we have a ministry called Laundry Love. And once a month on a Saturday, we go into laundromats and we pay for people's laundry. We say, well, you know, I'm Jeff from Cornerstone, or from uh, North Point Church. They're laughing. So I was there for a long time. <laughs> but I'm from North Point Church and I just want to, you know, pay for your laundry. Or, you know, is there anything I can pray with you about? About two weeks ago, Becca started talking to this this family, and there was actually two families there. Long story short, they ended up coming to church. All 10 of them were filled with the Holy Ghost. We baptized all of them too, in Jesus' name. She just texted me yesterday. She said, Pastor, laundry love yesterday. I've got another lady coming. She's coming to church, and I think we're going to teach her a Bible study too. So they're, they're doing fantastic. So some people say, well, you know, how did it all happen? Growth doesn't happen overnight. It was three long years of we handed out over 2,000 personal invite cards. We tried door hangers. We hung 1,500. In our area, it doesn't work. Not one phone call from that. Other churches, they're having phone calls and prayer requests and all kinds of stuff. You've got to find out what works for your area. And God has a plan for Wellston, however that's going to work. But we, statistically, the highest soul-winning tool is personal invitation, one-on-one -on -one conversation. And so we're getting out into the community. But it was three years of planting and sowing and watering. Oh, yeah, we're going to come to your church, and they never show up. Promise after promise. Yeah, we're going to come Sunday. And you tell everybody, I, I got guests coming. And it's crickets. It's like, where? And so it took a lot of planning, a lot of sowing, a lot of watering. But this year, our theme was grow. And 
since January of this year, we've had 28 filled with the Holy Ghost. We baptized upwards of 20. In an in a eight-day span, we had 14 of those people filled with the Holy Ghost. We baptized 11. <clears throat> but how does it happen? It happens through day in, day out, sharing the gospel with people. We had laundry love going. We have Adopt-A-Block. It's where we go into the community and we just give back to the community. Uh, once a month, we, we drop off uh, 12 gift bags of assorted items, toiletries, uh, household items, dry goods, different things, just to give back to the community. In September, we gave away backpacks to kids. And a church has to have an outlet where you're giving back into the community and not receiving anything in return. And so we went to the poorest area of Kenosha where we knew they're probably not even going to come to our church. But that's not what it's about. It's about blessing other people. And so our church continues to give, continues to bless other people. We, we do the, the laundry love. We, we were just thinking about, you know, should we continue laundry love? Because we hadn't seen any, anything from it. And we're like, well, we, we need to really put our effort in the, in the best place. Yeah. Right after we have that conversation, 14 people get filled with the Holy Ghost. Two families come from Laundry Love, and I said, well, guys, there's our answer. I guess we're, we're going to continue doing this. But we've got to follow God's voice, and we've got to be willing to, to sacrifice the sacred cows. Yes. You know, just because it's what Pentecost has always done doesn't mean that's all what we continue to do. And so we've got to be willing to get outside of the box, because we, we went into 2020, and I had, I had people walk away from a conversation. I've never had that happen. I mean, I'm talking to somebody at the store about God. His wife comes up, and he just walks off. I'm like, what in the world? I'm like, how are we going to get these people's attention? So we started paying for things for people, and that gets their attention right away. It's like, whoa, 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 what, what do you want? I said, I, I don't want anything. I'm just here to bless you. Well, I've never heard of that in my life. And so now it breaks the wall down. Now we start talking to people. Bef we didn't have anybody come to God, but I had notable healings in laundry love. In front of dryer number 19, I had a man had two torn rotator cuffs and God healed them both in the laundromat. <laughs> we, we had things like that happen, but we didn't have salvation things. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe this isn't the right thing. And then, then we have those two families come and we, we started the adopt a block and we're handing out stuff. Our goal is at Thanksgiving, the, the context that we make in adopt a block, we're going to do their Thanksgiving dinners for them. We're going to provide Thanksgiving dinner and also for Christmas. Just a way that we can give back. We started um, our own giving campaign. It's called Go By Giving. We can't all go to the mission field, but we can all give to the mission field. Our goal was to, to raise in pledges $15,000. We raised, raised over $25,000. So we're able, to, we're able to support eight foreign missionaries every month. And we give to Steve's for Christ. We give to Movie the Mission. We give to Christmas for Christ, ladies' ministry, men's ministry. And it's, it's offerings of 500 here, 1,000 there, 2,000 there because of the giving of the church. And folks, if, if we continue to give, God's going to continue to bless. And it was for the first three years, we were giving to other, into other people's fields. We were sowing into another man's field. We have to realize that the kingdom is bigger than our own church. Yes. That although we love life source, the kingdom is bigger than life source. And if we win a soul and they're going to someone else's church, God bless it. Send them. As long as they're in truth and as long as it's Holy Ghost, Jesus' name, baptism, it's the kingdom. Yes. Yes. And if, if you... Sow into another man's field, God will bless yours. Because we were sowing into laundry love, and souls were coming from another area. They were coming from another direction. They weren't necessarily completely lost. They were, they were prodigals. That's who God was sending us. Backsliders, they were coming back. That's what was happening. And we're just starting to see souls come from, from laundry love. But one of the things is if, if you... If you reach for the people 
the undesirables, the, the ones that may not smell the best, the ones that may have an addiction. And I mean, I know all about your breaking chains. So you guys are all open to this. I know I'm preaching to the choir. But if we reach the undesirables of life, if we reach those that nobody wants, God will give this church the ones that everybody wants. And so uh, that's kind of where we're at, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, it's so important that the gospel needs to reach everybody. So it's not, it's not a white thing. It's not a black thing. It's not a yeah. male thing. It's not a female thing that we're supposed to reach whoever we can reach no matter where they are, what they're going through and what they're doing. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. I've always felt, and I've seen this in your life, uh, that your love for people, your discipleship, um, the Bible studies that you do, developing people on a personal level um, is probably one of the greatest outreaches that we can do, building relationships with, with other people. That, that was one of the things that, that the Lord showed me. So the first three years, so we didn't see a lot of growth. We saw backsliders coming back. We had some transfers come in. But not the, not the Holy Ghost outpourings. When I saw a change in the, the, the new births was when the, the people of the church started to step up their commitment in private where they started fasting and they started praying and they started developing a relationship with God and they started to say, Pastor, if you need me to teach Bible studies, I'm ready. So when, the, when, when we started to have people available to teach the Bible studies and teach discipleship, that's when we saw the growth. But it wasn't until we had that, that those coming because I, I could teach. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm full-time at the church now and, and I could teach. I could teach discipleship. I can teach Bible studies. But that's not God's plan. Pastor, it's not God's plan for you to do it all. You need your church to help you. You need your church to, to teach the Bible studies, to teach the discipleship. And when we started having that, because right now we have probably about eight people teaching Bible studies and, and discipleship. And, and that's when I started to see the growth. And God's, got, God's not going to send the babies if you can't take care of them. And so it takes the church. It takes everybody. You don't need a Bible school degree to teach a Bible study. You, you don't need leadership 101 to, to teach somebody leadership or, or discipleship. All you have to do in order to lead somebody is be one step ahead of them. You don't need a, a whole portfolio. You don't need to memorize the entire Bible. There's Bible studies that you can just read through and take somebody through it. So the, the biggest thing I saw when we started to grow was when people started to say, okay, I'm going to teach. I, I don't have a lot of experience, but I'm going to do it. And the best way to learn the Bible is to teach the Bible. When you got to Kenosha, um, there was no church there. No. So you started with just your family? We started as a home friendship group, home, home, a Bible study in a, in a small group. And then from after we got about 20 people, we started to meet in a hotel. Um, what does that look, what does church in a hotel look like? Um, so on a, on a regular Sunday, we have uh, two different setup teams. One team is on one week, one team is on the other week. And it's a challenge getting people to, to, co to you know, commit to that because you have setup and teardown. So you arrive at 7.30 and you set up, church starts at 10. So you have to be set up in an hour so they can have a sound check and go through their songs and things because we don't have a building to have praise practice. It's at our house on Thursday nights. Okay. And so not having a building is a challenge, but it can be done. Um, so they have their sound check from 8 to 8.30 to 9.30, and then from 9.30 to about 10 till we have prayer. But <clears throat> everything that we have for that church is in a storage, a 20-foot storage unit behind the hotel, and it's in roller carts. Our sound system, our instruments, uh, for the most part, we do carry some back and forth in the cars. But our projection, our screens, um, all of our... Our sound equipment is, is back in there. It might do you well to go on Facebook and look up North Point in Kenosha and kind of, you would never know that it's in a hotel, how they have it set up. All the work, of course, 
we've got to work out our own salvation with, right. So to think that ministry is not a job or not a work is, is incorrect. And so it, it's a work, but we're working for what God is trying to do. So um, on average, you're not going to be there um, today, but on average, what is, you've been there how long? Four years. Four years, starting with just your family in a Bible study at your house. What would be an average number of attendance? 65. And obviously, through your hard work, through your love, through the, your labor, and other people getting on board, you're mm -hmm. able to. I remember a pastor told me one time, um, he took a church. And the, the board, the elder board said, how many people are we going to run in five years? How many, you know, projections? And um, he made a very simple statement. He says, we'll have as many people as we can love. And that's important because we, the church, it, we're not here for entertainment. Right. We're not ready for the show to start. Right. We are a working body of Christ. Um, so two things I want to ask you before we close. We have a couple minutes. Um, number one is because you are familiar, you and your family are very familiar with our church. Mm -hmm. um, you have sown into our church. You have, every time that you come, you have brought something specific. Um, your love, um, you've always been on our side as far as our church. Mm -hmm. um, what is, you're going you're gonna to preach in a little bit. You're going to preach what God gave you. But if there's anything that, this, this is the representation of our church. Not everybody but this representation, what, what's something that you would say that you feel is maybe a timely word for our church in our culture and with what's going on in our world? What would you say to our church family? Number one, first and foremost, pray like you've never prayed before. Many times it's not the fasting. We can do the fasting because we like to crucify ourselves. We like to be hard on ourselves. We like to make ourselves suffer. But the challenge is spending time with Jesus and learning his voice and walking in the spirit. The Bible says if you walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't fall if you walk in the spirit. We have to pray, church. And that's one of the things that God told me. He said, pray like you've never prayed before. And that's all he said. And I've been on a journey trying to figure that out. Is it more time? Is it a certain way? And I think it's all of the above. We have to change the way that we pray. We've got to be willing to get out of bed when we're tired. We've got to be willing to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pray here until I get an answer. You may not be a preacher, but you need an answer for those people at work. Because the Bible says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks a reason of the hope that lies within. It's not talking about the preachers. It's talking about us believers. You've got to have an answer for this world. And the only way you're going to have an answer is when you learn his voice and you learn what it sounds like. And the only place you're going to find that's in prayer. You've got to pray. You've got to get alone with God. Well, yeah, I pray in the shower. Well, you better have a very uh, lot of money to pay for the water bill because if that's the only place you pray, and I get it, we're busy people. But we've got to get unbusy. There's just no easy way to put it. We have to pray. We've got to get alone with God. You pray in your car, fine. I had great prayer meetings with God in my car, but there's got to be alone time. Jesus went into the garden. We've got to, we've got to have our garden moment. You've got to have a place where you can go to. Because I, I remember one specific day, I was kneeling by, the, by our couch, and I, I said, God, I feel your spirit so strong. But I've got to go to work. God knows you got to work. God knows you got responsibilities. He knows you got to take the kids to school. And, and I know we take Jesus with us, with us but, but there, this moment I said, God, will you be here when I get home? And he was, when I got home, it was as strong or stronger. God desires to spend time with us, folks. He longs to spend time with us. Stop whipping yourself. Because you make a mistake. Stop beating yourself up. We're his people. And the sheep 
of his pasture, not Satan's, not somebody else's. Just because we have a bad day, he doesn't kick us out of the, out of the family. I mean, it, we don't do that to our children. You know, our kids have a bad day or, or they fail a test. Are we going to kick them out of our family? Maybe they don't measure up to, to the standards that, that your family upholds. Are, are you really going to kick them out of your family? And the Bible says, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does your heavenly Father want to give the Holy Spirit to them that love him or them that ask him? So my biggest thing, the, the, the whole crux, the whole thing, and I don't think there's any more to say, we have to pray. And we've got to get a hold of God and we've got to hear his voice. You've got to know what his voice sounds like. And it's going to be different for everybody. We can't say, well, do this and this and this, and this is what God's voice sounds like. No, it's going to be unique. We're all unique, and God uses us just as we are. But, folks, we've got to pray. That's good. Is there anything else you'd like to add? The church will grow when you're ready to grow. When you decide that you're going to step up your commitment. I'm not talking about crazy, you know, outside of our time constraints. But you determine within your spirit, I'm going to do everything in my power to draw closer to him. When it starts to become a tidal wave in the church, you're going to start to look around one day. And I told my church this, or, our, or I told God's church. I said, you're going to come to church and not know who's there. Well, I, I've never seen those people before. If, if this church gets a hold of this, you're going to look around one day and you're going to say, wow, I, I don't know half our church. Where did all these people come from? And it's because the church started to birth within, within themselves that, okay, I'm going to step up my commitment within myself. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to fast more. I'm going to be committed and, and just draw closer to him. Let's all stand. Let's all stand in closing. Uh, Brother Zimmerman, would you just pray over us as a church? Heavenly Father, God, this is your church. These are your people. They're called by your name. And God, I pray today that you would wrap your arms of love around every heart. Lord, I feel brokenness in the building today. God, I feel hearts that they feel like they don't measure up. They don't, they don't feel like they've attained to where you want them to be. But Lord, I pray today, show them your love. Show them your mercy, God. You, you are a kind, kind Father. You are a loving Father. And, and Lord, you, I, I pray that you'd wrap your arms of love around this church and, and reconfirm their callings and reconfirm how much you love them and you care for them. God, I pray that the Holy Ghost fire would rest upon this church and cleanse every heart and cleanse every mind, God. Draw us closer. Draw us to a place, God, where we depend upon you, Jesus. Uh, God, take us to that next Next place in you, Lord. The Bible says that you went a little further and prayed. God, I pray that you would help us to go a little further in our personal walks. God, take us a little further in, in what we do and how we serve and what we're a part of, Lord. Touch every heart, every life, every mind. God, draw us closer to you. God, place in every heart and every life in this building a desire to hunger and to thirst and to love you, Jesus. I thank you for the opportunity to serve in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come today. God, it was not a waste of time. It was not a coincidence that they're here, but they are drawn here by your spirit. And I pray, God, have sweet communion with us in this service. God, as we transition, Lord, we come to magnify and exalt you and lift you up, God. We give you our best praise and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. They all said amen. 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 God bless you. In about 10 minutes, you'll meet us around the altar for prayer. But thankful that every one of you is here. Greet one another.